going there, Mommy and Daddy? Well, it's just, it's another test for you. Don't worry about it. Let's just get you down to the hospital. Okay. She'd been to the hospital many times for x-rays and stuff like that. So, um, they arrived and they took her in. And what happened was that three or four very large men dressed in white picked her up and carried her away from her parents into a room for the pre-op procedures that were to take place before the surgery without explanation, or if they tried to explain, she couldn't hear what was said to her. She was very upset to be set upon by white-coated goons. That's what they were, as far as she knew. What are they going to do to me? She was terrified. They took her into the room. They took all her clothes off. She was stripped naked. Then she was put on a table, and she was thrashing around and fighting, so they tied her down. They spread-eagled her, tied down both arms and both legs so she couldn't fight back, and proceeded with, with, with uh, the preparations that they needed to take care of, one of which was to catheterize her. She, they didn't wait for the anesthesia. They just put the catheter right into her urethra, okay, as she lay there, not knowing why this was happening or what was about to take place. They gave her a spinal tap, a giant needle jammed into her spine to remove some cerebrospinal fluid, which was a part of also of the preparations. There were, there were IVs inserted into her arms. And the, the whole idea of, uh, you, you know, the, the, penetra the traumatic, penetrating intrusiveness of the needles and the catheter, all of this were just expressed in her dreams and in strange sexual fantasies she had at the time. This is why it's, it's so hard to explain. I need a whole semester to really tell you the story of what happened there. Let me just pull out one incident that took place in our, in our dialogue seven days a week that were occurring as she was remembering and reliving the trauma of the surgery and the pre-op procedures beforehand by the goons. She came in one day to see me, and she was completely silent. She wouldn't talk. And then suddenly, as, as she was sitting there, she, she, she took her hand up like this and then slapped her face as hard as she could. Then she slapped her face with the other hand as hard as she could. And then she began, wham, 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 wham. It was like a boxing champion practicing hitting the, you, you, know, you know, practicing for the boxing match or something like that. I, I, I jumped on her. I won't let her do this if I can stop her. And I held her arms down and made her tell me why she was hitting herself so hard. She said, I hate my own guts. I deserve to die, I should die. And she'd reach her hand out and then even close her fist and smash it into her face. Why are you doing this, Jean? My God! And it finally came out that she was about to tell me a secret she had never told anyone. She was so ashamed of and she was sure it proved she was evil. What was that secret? That she had strange sexual fantasies of doing weird things to baby boys. And I said, what are you talking about? Tell me what are your strange sexual fantasies? And she then described how she had a very erotic, sexually charged fantasy image that would come to her. And it made her feel real good sexually, but she's horrified by the fact that it does. And she'd hid it from anyone ever finding out about it. That what she wanted to do in her fantasy was take a little boy's penis, a little baby boy's penis, take a long glass tube, and like put it into the urethra, put it right into the penis and kind of like push it down into there and kind of go like this, kind of a strange, kind of strange glass intercourse onto a penis taking place like this and she would get all oh, excited, you know, thinking it's sexually and get a big orgasm out of this, out of this uh, thought of doing that. But to her it was so evil to do something so sick and depraved and destructive and harmful and sadistic. But as I listened to the fantasy, I thought, oh, shit, I see what this is. This is a memory of the catheterization. It's a traumatic memory expressed in an erotically charged fantasy of something she was doing where she is in control. But the real heart of the matter is it's a part, it's a part of the trauma of, I've got a chill going through me now about it because I'm, I'm remembering so many things like this. There were, there were different aspects of the attack against her were performed, and they came back in memory of form, things like this. Just it, This is worth just saying to you guys. A lot of times, you know, we have people develop in the course of their lives sort of odd, weird sexual fantasies, turn on things that they don't know what it is. A lot of times, it can be an expression of trauma. It gets mixed up with sexuality. Nobody even knows why it does. The real point of her, her image there was it had nothing to do with sex. 
It just acquired sexuality as, a, as its mode of expression. It was to do with a child being victimized by being basically raped with a glass. I don't know what the catheter was made of. It was made of rubber, maybe, but when they jammed it into her. Now, do you guys see something? Jean was not sexually abused from an outside legal point of view. She was just treated medically. But phenomenologically, this was a rape, wasn't it? You know, these guys come, strip your clothes off, spread eagle you, and jam equipment up into your private parts. What is a rape? Phenomenologically, you have all you have all the features there, don't you? So I wouldn't know whether to say whether she was sexually abused or not. I, I would say she was, this is from her own point of view anyway. So finally, what happened is that um, they completed their business. Now she said she told me how she lay there on the on the table. Spread Eagle, thrashing, fighting, trying to rip free, get away from these horrible goons. She didn't know why they were doing these things to her. What she wanted more than anything else was just to cry out, just to scream her lungs out at them. But that clashed with what she had been taught as a child. The parents had a little, you know, a little rectangular picture hanging up, framed little saying in, in their home. Children are to be are to be seen, not heard, or something like that. Jean was taught from an early age never to make any noise. Like her mother would throw bridge parties for her people she worked with. So three or four women would come over, they would play bridge, and Jean would be made to sit in a little pink dress on the couch and not even move at all, and not say anything. During the entire bridge party, it might last three or four hours. If she even needed to go to the bathroom and interrupted the bridge to go to the bathroom, she would, the mother would let her do that, but then would beat her later for causing an interference. So it was like, a, it was like an, a, an iron law enforced of silent silence. But she wanted to scream because the goons were killing her, raping her, hurting her, stabbing her in all these different parts of her body. And so what happened is she split off an altar, and it was gene number two, in order to scream. Like another child appeared then, and she screamed bloody murder, blood-curdling cries. And she did them in my office, too lying there on the floor, thrashing around, mixing me up completely with the goons, running away from me into the corner, thinking I was coming after her with all my, all my instruments to stab into her. That's what it's like. And then screaming, screaming, screaming. So the, the, the core of the loudmouth, impulsive, extroverted girl that gene number two was, was born out of the need to scream in pain in the midst of a, an assault. The assault itself, occurs after a lie and a betrayal by the parents. Why did they lie to me? Well, then that, again, is seen as they hate me anyway. They want me dead. And then also, it's, a, it's in the context of this horrific pain inside of her head. She's a girl who's attacked from the outside by the betrayal of the parents and the goons with the medical procedures, attacked from the inside by a malignant cancer. She's a pretty much in trouble, wouldn't you say? Gene number two was born. She had the surgery. It was successful. They saved her life. They saved both. She had a little bit of tunnel vision after that, because the tumor, they had to take off part of the optic, some of the, some of the nervous tissue, in order to get the, get the cancer out. But it was, it was remarkable in her, that, that she was able to survive the whole thing. But she was not the same person after the surgery as she had been before. And I thought I would tell you a dream. And if you're in my personality class, you might recognize this dream. But it's a dream that began to recur then in, in, during the recovery from surgery. We're almost at the end. Don't go anywhere. Wait till you hear this dream. You know, the dream symbolizes what a person's experiencing. This dream symbolizes, I think, the destructive effect of the cumulative series of traumas that had occurred up to this point, capped off by the medical disaster. The dream is this, that... Um, she, Jean, she would be age eight now, is standing in the small train station on the tracks near her home where she grew up. There was a train station there, and you could go there and catch the train and go into Manhattan or wherever you were going. And it was a, a wood structure, like 12 by 18 feet or something like that. She's alone in there in the dream. And she looks around, and there's flames beginning to lick up from around the, all around the corners and where the, where the walls meet the floor and so on. And pretty soon the flames are getting bigger and bigger, and she's right in the middle of it. Pretty soon the building is engulfed in a massive fire. 
and it burns all the way to the ground until there's nothing but smoking ashes there. And she's gone. But somehow there's like vision, you can still, she, the scene is still somehow apparent. And she, she notices, she's not there physically in the dream, she's just a disembodied spectator somehow of the way you can be. Her, bo her bodily presence has been incinerated. And she notices two little eyes, E-Y-E-S, in the uh, in ashes that have somehow survived the inferno. And they're kind of bouncing up and down like little Mexican jumping beans or something. And they're kind of glancing at one another and glancing off and glancing around. That's it. That's all the dream is. But I interpret the dream, there's a lot you could say about a dream like that, but I interpret the dream in among other ways as a concrete <coughs> symbolization of, of the annihilating effect of the, of the accumulating sequence of traumas, you know, finally finished off with this horrendous brain surgery. And she continued to have that dream real often, like once or twice a week, in all the ensuing years, and it did not stop until she and I were way down the pathway of beginning to heal these traumas. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do now, not now today, but next time, is go into the story of some of the adventures she and I, she and I had working with her multiplicity, and then the amazing sequence of stages that she followed as they began slowly to coalesce and finally came together into a wonderful unit. So stop there. Thank you.